You're watching FJTN, the Federal Judicial Television Network. That just about covers your conditions, Mr. Ehrman. We just have a few special release conditions you'll need to follow. Um, no access to a computer or a connected device except a landline telephone at any time. No access to a modem. And finally, no access to the internet or BBS. Okay, now that we've gone through your conditions, Mr. Ehrman, do you have any questions? Well, just one. <clears throat> when you say that I can't access a computer, what do you mean? Well, uh, it means just what it says. You may not access a computer. That's one of your special conditions. Well, then, what do you mean by computer? <laughs> the condition says no access to a computer or a connected device except a landline telephone at any time seems clear to me you can't use a computer or a connected device. Look, I, I don't mean to be a pain, but, but, but everything has a computer in it nowadays. I, I don't want to inadvertently uh, uh, violate, that's the word you used, right, uh, any, any, any conditions. <laughs> I need to know what I can or cannot do. I, I mean, well, cars have had computers in them for years. Does that mean that I can't drive a car? And if I can't drive, how do I get around? Mr. Ehrman, we can certainly be reasonable. You won't violate your conditions if you drive a car. Besides, it says, or connected devices. Okay, then what about ATMs? What? ATMs, those little boxes on the street corners with money in them. <laughs> I know what an ATM is, Mr. Ehrman. Yeah, well, they're all computers and connected devices. Well, you think that ATM out in the middle of nowhere is just spitting out money because you asked? <laughs> of course not. It's connected to a bank, and that bank's connected to another, and so on. What, you don't believe me? Look it up on the internet. I can't. <laughs> Mr. Ehrman. Jeremy. May I call you Jeremy? You know, one of those conditions is I'm supposed to get a, a gig job, right? Right. <laughs> and how am I supposed to do that when every single cash register is a computer? There goes a job at 7-Eleven. Not to mention a, a job at the mall. Maybe I could get a job at a gas station. Oops. Even gas pumps have computers in them. With this condition, I couldn't even work at a gas station. Hmm. Whatever shall I do? Look, Jeremy, like I said before, we can be reasonable. <sighs> could I use a dumb terminal? A what? Don't you even know what a dumb terminal is? It's one step above a glass TTY. It has a minimally addressable cursor, but no on-screen editing or other features normally supported by a smart terminal. Once upon a time, when uh, glass TTYs were common and an addressable cursor was something special, what is now called a dumb terminal has for a smart terminal. A smart terminal, on the other hand, has enough computing capability to render graphics or to offload some kind of front end processing from the computer it's talking to. You see, as I've rendered this term semi obsolescent, but you might still hear a variant of the term act like a smart terminal used to describe the thing you know, the PC or workstation with respect to programs that are mainly out of remote server storage using the device as displays. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to our fourth edition of Special Needs Offenders. I'm David Leathery with the Federal Judicial Center. As you saw in our open, our talking population today is the cyber criminal. This scene was humorous, but like all humor, it does contain a grain of truth. A cyber criminal with all of his gadgets, gizmos, and jargon can be intimidating. He can cause officers, like the officer in our clip, to think he's from another planet. Our purpose here today is to bring that cyber criminal back down to earth. By learning what to expect from a cyber criminal, officers can devise plans to effectively manage and supervise this growing population. And believe it or not, there are investigation tips and supervision techniques that don't require a degree in computer science. 
Today's broadcast is the second of a three-step process used to explore special needs offenders. The first step, which you already should have read by now, is to the desktop reference, introducing cybercrime, the special needs offender bulletin. We wrap up our coverage of cyber criminals with an online conference. That's the final step to allow districts to share even more information. Now, this broadcast is for you, so ask questions and share your thoughts. All of today's discussion questions are contained in the broadcast participant guide, which along with the bulletin provides you with all the information you need to participate. We'll start with the world of hackers and crackers. We'll learn who they are and what they do. Then we'll take a virtual tour of computer hardware. After the tour, we'll take a short break and return for our second half, which will analyze a case from pretrial services to supervised release. I'll be here throughout the program, but we have a lot to cover, so let's begin and go to our moderator, Mark Sherman. Thanks, David, and welcome. Our first topic is a popular one, hackers and crackers. We have several experts here to discuss the issues with us. Joining me in the studio today is Lanny Newell. Senior Pretrial Services Officer from the Western District of Texas. Welcome, Lanny. Thank you, Mark. We also have two probation officers joining us by phone from the Central District of California. Mark Stein is the officer who supervised one of the first hackers in our system, Kevin Poulsen. And Larry Hawley is currently supervising super hacker Kevin Mitnick. Both Poulsen and Mitnick were featured in the Special Needs Offenders Bulletin. Welcome, Larry and Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Before getting into our panel discussion, let's first take a look at an interview we recently conducted with cybercrime expert and Orange County, California probation officer, Ed Harrison. Ed knows a little something about this topic, and he graciously agreed to share his insights with us. Let's take a look. Traditionally, a hacker has just simply been, been someone who is um, a computer code warrior, some, some programmer who, who sits there and punches in the commands that are, will eventually become the computer program. A hack is just simply taking advantage of a loophole in the system, taking advantage of some flaw in the way things work to their own advantage. If the original data remains there, they don't see it as a crime. Now, there's a computer vandal element now that vandal element is, is the denial of service attacks, the famous attacks that we've seen in the media where it's like, hey, I'm going to be notorious, I'm going to shut down eBay, I'm going to shut down this bank or, or this exchange. And, and that's, that personality is more like a tagger. Um, he wants to get a reputation, he wants to get it fast, and, and it's a huge ego rush for him to see that his exploits made the national news. And the true hacker has tried to distance themselves by starting to talk about, oh, well, they're a cracker. Um, however, just the, the proliferation of the term hacker by the media has, has almost eliminated the word cracker at all. Common usage has just made it that a hacker has become what a cracker was supposed to be, and that is just a, a computer criminal. They spell freak, P-H-R-E-A-K, and it's phone freak is, is someone who is, is just in, enchanted and entranced by the whole telecommunications system, not just what they could do with computer networking, but actually being able to manipulate the phone system, to be able to make phone calls for free, to be able to, to exploit others' voicemail for their own needs, to be able to make calls on other people's dimes. The freak tends to be much more social than a, than a hacker. However, there's a lot of folks that'll go to either side and play both sides of those, those um, uh, crimes. The Kevin Mitnick case was very interesting in that he certainly started out as a phone freak and many of his hacking exploits were to get information that perpetuated his activities as a phone freak. They have this need to, to publish um, the information and, and their, their feelings and what's, what's going on and so they put these elaborate documents online and it, it's incredible when we interview these offenders it, it, it matches these manifestos so we've got a tremendous amount of data that we're starting to compile now and, and showing that there's certain trends in these computer criminals certainly they all thrive on systems they they want to explore complex systems it's a challenge to them um, they get a rush 
by being able to demonstrate a competence in manipulating those systems. And for a lot of these folks, the criminal justice system is just another hack. They'll try to buddy up to you, and that's part of their social engineering, where they're manipulating you to learn as much as they can about the system. They tend to be compulsive plan and list makers. It's very common to find um, at a uh, computer evidence scene uh, spiral notebooks with complex notes of um, their exploits where you can find um, specific entries in their own handwriting in these notebooks that correspond with crimes that you're investigating. So that's very common to find that. They have just fanatical need to organize their hard drives and, and these notebooks, but yet their home life can be absolutely chaotic. It's not unusual to have to push the pizza boxes and empty soda cans out of the way to even get to the computer. Usually you'll see a lot of passive aggressive behavior, um, especially in a supervision model where you're supervising one of these folks. Yes, I understand I have to do that. Yes, I understand this is the term of my probation. And then they'll walk out of there and they'll say, son of a, and they'll go do whatever they want to do to torpedo your supervision. Be aware that they're going to set some traps. Um, I would not be surprised at all to find that you were being tape recorded um, when you were interacting with this person. I would not be surprised at all to find a diary of your interactions with that, off, uh, with that uh, offender. So, I mean, these are things that you should certainly be aware of. Don't think that if you're going you're gonna to get in a hacker's face and have him shrivel and, and just tell you everything, one of the worst things you can do with a hacker is get in his face. Um, it's, it's just, you've, you've instantly jumped to the I'm not telling you anything mode as soon as you do that. I've found success in joking and kidding with them and, um, and I'll bring up anecdotally some of their past exploits and inquire, you know, hey, what do you think about those guys who brought down eBay last week? Or what do you think about these guys who did this? How, how could they have done that better? And they turn into a teacher then, and it really strokes their ego, and they'll tell you, I've learned from hackers the recipes to make street drugs. I've learned from hackers the, the recipes to make bombs. I've learned all these different things just by simply allowing them to become a teacher. We don't need to understand how to ingest drugs in order to supervise a drug offender. We don't need to be able to operate a firearm to be able to supervise someone who's a weapons dealer. But those are certainly traits that help. But it's more about understanding the personality. We are behaviorists. I mean, we're really looking at how someone behaves. The computer is simply an instrument to the crime. Okay, Larry Hawley, let's start with you, since not only are you supervising uh, one of the most notorious uh, uh, hackers, Kevin Mitnick, um, we're going to take a look at the first set of discussion questions in the participant guide. And in light of Ed Harrison's description that we've just heard, uh, on the Hacker Cracker profile and the exploits of Kevin Mitnick, what characteristics should officers be aware of when investigating this and supervising this type of defendant or offender? Well, based upon my experience with Kevin Mitnick, Ed Harrison's description of hackers is very accurate. Kevin prides himself on his intelligence. He, he has, uh, he's not been a note taker during our meetings, although he has confirmed our conversations with follow-up correspondence for clarification mm -hmm. almost in every case. Recently, that slowed down some, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, uh, that a hacker can be very social. I mean, Kevin's forte was social engineering, and he's very intelligent, persuasive, and charming when he wants to be. Okay. Thank you. Uh, now, Mark, you've, you know, you've supervised Kevin Poulsen, who's been through the system. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, the characteristics and whether you thought that Ed Harrison's description was accurate. I agree with Larry that Ed's description was uh, accurate. Kevin Poulsen, the hacker I supervised, brought a small pocket-sized notebook and pen to all of our office visits mm -hmm. and kept detailed notes on our conversations and would follow up with uh, letters to confirm and uh, just to make sure that he knew what was going on and what the instructions were. Uh, he was a bit socially awkward, and I think this demonstrates how hackers can run the gamut from being the more social uh, person like uh, Mitnick, uh, who ex whose expertise was uh, social engineering, and then Kevin Poulsen. Mm -hmm. While he was able to do those kind of things, his expertise was much more uh, along the lines of the computer 
um, hacking in, in the phone system itself. Okay. I mean, and you've hit on something that's really important for us to, um, to emphasize, I think, and that is even though we're trying to construct a profile here with you guys and with Ed, um, that there are differences within this uh, population, and, uh, and you've just hit on that with the fact that Poulsen was perhaps less socially oriented than, than um, somebody like Kevin Mitnick. Um, Lanny, what are we learning from, from this end, uh, particularly uh, for the pretrial services perspective? Well, you, I guess we have to keep in mind that neither of these two guys ever made it out on bond. Right. Uh, so, you know, we really, on the pretrial side, haven't had a lot of experience supervising. Uh, I do think that knowing, you know, getting a heads up on these characteristics is going to be really helpful not only when we do our investigations, but also when we you know, get into the supervision with the, with the defendants. Eventually, uh, this is going to happen, at, at so some you're going to need to be time, prepared. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, what we want to do now is throw it out to the field and go to our first field classroom. California Central Probation, we'll start with you. Any reactions to either what's been said thus far uh, or reactions to the discussion questions in the participant guide? Good morning, Mark. This is Chris Sutton from California Central, and we have Ed Harrison here also. Um, we concur with the information that's been put out in the bulletin, and we'd like to take it a step further from our experience with these offenders out here. We find that they, uh, we tend to classify them in three categories. Are they a pedophile? Are they a hacker? Are they an isolated professional person who's kind of a chat room groupie who's getting into this type of stuff because of financial pressure? Um, we do find that they are a challenge to one's wits. You have to be very strategic when you're dealing with them, and when you're making contact with them, you have to have your plan planned out and be ready to be um, confronted on the minutia incidences because they do see black and white. They don't go the middle of the road. Um, one of the things we do like to do is get in touch with the case managers um, in the institutions where they were to see about visitors and computer access there. We like to carry it over into having the case agent profile them and work in a collaborative effort with them. And we do like to throw out the question to them, um, kind of what they use, and I'd like to be a millionaire. Who would you use as your lifeline if you had a computer system question and you needed help? So hopefully that gets some questions generated. Okay. Uh, reactions, Lanny? Uh, no, not really. I kind of agree with what she said. These, these guys are going to be di very difficult to deal with, and, and we need to stay on top of the supervision with them and be prepared for, it, it, I, I want to refer to them as antics, because that's right. kind of what they are. They're going to challenge us at every step. Right. Okay, Larry, Larry Hawley, any reactions to what your colleague Chris Sutton has said? Well, I think she's right. I think the thing is, is uh, in dealing with these guys, you have to keep things very direct and let them know uh, what, their, what their bounds are. and, and and deal with them on, on a case-by-case -case situation. Mm -hmm. And what's been your lifeline uh, if, if you've had to, you, I, I want to get back to this uh, notion that Ed Harrison talked about in the interview about, uh, and, and what we led up with in the opening segment, uh, video segment, where a hacker can be intimidating, especially for someone who's less familiar with computers. And I wonder what that was like for you and, and sort of how you've dealt with it and what your lifeline has been. Well, like I said in one, one instance, uh, I'm not a computer, a, a knowledgeable computer user. I I was intimidated initially, and then what I uh, I drew upon my chief probation officer and uh, my supervisor, and they said, hey, you know, you've been doing this for a long time, and if you just follow the conditions of supervision and use the standard techniques of supervision, you're going to be fine. And I think that was very encouraging and helped me a lot. Okay, uh, Chris, ha ha does that respond to some of the points that you've made? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, we also like to um, ask these people, are they an AM or a PM person? Because that's going to govern when we want to be out there um, making the home visits and making the home inspections. Right. Good. Helpful. Um, and I also want to make a note, because you referred to it in the way that you categorize uh, different offenders um, that we, in the second part of this broadcast, we're going to be covering an offender, or starts out as a defendant, who is at least accused of downloading child pornography using a computer. So we'll get to that uh, for sure. And I know that that's a concern of a lot of officers um, because that seems to be the predominant type of computer user in addition to fraudsters, and he's one of those too, uh, on your caseloads. So we will definitely get to that. I want to move on now. 
uh, actually to Texas Western Probation and Pretrial Services and ask you whether you have any reactions either to anything that's been said thus far or to the discussion questions. Texas Western, are you there? Hi, this is Mark Hewitt in San Antonio. Do you hear me? Hi, Mark. Thanks for being with us. Go ahead. What's your question or your comment? We have a few comments, sure. and I appreciate talking to Larry earlier today. Okay. But um, just in terms of answering the question on the handout, in terms of characteristics, a few things I jotted down was simply I would want to get a good idea of the hobbies and interests of the offender, what his pastimes are, um, get a good assessment of the knowledge of his knowledge of computers, his financial status and activity by a thorough review of credit reports and telecommunication bills, get a good idea of associations he might belong to and his associates, his job, job requirements, travel needs, and a good layout, idea of what the layout of the residence is. Um, I was also thinking about how many of the techniques we can use in supervising these offenders are very similar to my position as a senior officer in white collar fraud, um, thoroughly reviewing financial documents, inspecting, relying a lot on law enforcement, collateral contacts, and uh, something what Larry was saying earlier to me was that with Mr. Mitnick that uh, one big important thing to consider is don't allow the offender to get you as an officer to make snap decisions right. right on the spot in your office. They take a lot of notes. We can take a lot of notes, too. Okay. And um, Hold on a second. Let me, let me stop you there. That's because about all. Those are some of the things I had jotted down. Great. Uh, I want to get some reactions very quickly from Lanny because your question uh, or your comments um, raise several issues that provide an excellent segue to the next discussion question. So I want to move on, but first I want to get a quick reaction. I'm glad you touched base with Larry Hawley. I want to get a quick reaction from your colleague sitting here, Lanny Newville. Well, I think Mark's right on target with that. Uh, I think the more information we can get about how they're living their life and, and their, their financial situation, the better off we're going to be in as far as you know, providing supervision and staying on top of whether or not they're in compliance with their conditions. Excellent. So a lot of the things that Mark was talking about rank true. Yes, yes. Okay, good. Larry and Mark, bear with us a second. We're going to move on to the next uh, discussion question. Uh, and thank you very much, Texas Western and California Central. Um, moving right along, based on these characteristics that we've been talking about thus far, uh, what considerations might govern investigation and supervision of a hacker or cracker? And again, what conventional supervision techniques could an officer use? We've already talked about that a little bit, but Mark Stein, let's come back to you and get your input, particularly in terms of how it worked with your supervision of Kevin Polson. Mark, are you how, there? Yeah, how it worked with Kevin, he was uh, very manipulative. Uh, he tried to manipulate both me and the system, and he looked at the uh, rules of supervision and all of supervision as a whole as a game and something to try and beat or get around. Um, what I did, my basic approach to supervision, uh, I'm kind of a personable guy and I humanized myself and that kind of broke down the adversarial relationship. Um, although right about two or three months into supervision, he did take the matter back to court saying that I was being way too restrictive on him, not allowing him to use a computer. Um, unfortunately, the judge backed us up on that. Mm -hmm. um, but once he started to see me as a person, it, it all kind of melted away. Uh, I think you just have to set clear supervision goals. Mm -hmm. And like Larry said earlier, um, don't make any snap decisions because they're going to write down everything you say and bring it back. So everything you say better be pretty good. Right. Um, yeah. In terms of supervision techniques, that's how I handled it. Um, I found the flexibility that the court gave us in this particular case um, as far as his access to the computer or the internet or anything like that, it was all up to me. Um, now, while Kevin did that, allowed Kevin to bring it up just about at every visit, saying, "Hey, Mark, you know, you can you can allow me to do this or you can allow me to do that." Um, it was 
nice that it was in my lap. I, I liked having that because I knew the judge would back me up on my decisions. Okay, so you want to be prepared for manipulation, you need to be flexible, uh, you need to rely on some of your most traditional supervision techniques that you've used in other contexts, and uh, something that you mentioned yesterday when we were running through the rehearsal list thing, you don't want to try to match wits with them. No, I mean, they're going to know more about the computer than you. I right. mean, that's all they do. Yeah. Kevin's whole life was about the computer and the right. phone system. Right. Uh, anybody who spends that much time working on it like that, they're going to know more than you. And you don't, at the, at the end of the day, you don't really have to be a computer expert to supervise these guys. They're just criminals who use a computer uh, to do what they do. And so your, your good old-fashioned probation skills are going to come in very handy. Larry Hawley, makes sense to you? Makes sense. Yeah, tremendous sense. I think uh, with Kevin Mednick, he did the same thing, but then we, I told him, I said, you know, we're not changing anything. We're going from the court order. And he said, well, you have the authority to change it. And I said, yeah, but uh, it's it's increments. You know, it's not giant steps. And I think that's what uh, we we built a sense of trust and mutual relationship on that, uh, that he knew that I wasn't going to make uh, – uh, drastic changes in the in the conditions of the supervision, even though the court allowed us to make certain decisions. We weren't going to do it. Uh, we were going to have to, it was going to come with time. Excellent. Uh, okay, Lenny, I want to come back to you, but before we do that, I want to throw it out to the field. And uh, let's hear from Alabama Southern Probation. What's been your experience? Uh, and then we'll go to Oklahoma Western. Alabama Southern? Yes, sir. Uh, Mark, this is Gary Whittle, U.S. Probation and Mobile. Uh, many of the uh, points that Ed Harrison made uh, we find to be uh, consistent with uh, investigating uh, and supervision of hackers and crackers. Okay. The officer should uh, determine the offender's love of systems through the judicious use of games and challenges, uh, stroke his ego uh, by encouraging him to teach the officer about hacking and cracking. Mm -hmm and understand the offender's passive-aggressive nature and the futility of using traditional rewards. Okay. The uh, conventional supervision techniques would include visual inspection of uh, the residence when you're making home inspections or during the pre-sentence investigation stage. And at that point, you would make note of uh, evidence of excessive note-taking or use of electronic uh, computing or communication devices. Uh, Record examination, such as uh, his pager or telephone, credit card billing information, and similar records, and obtaining information from collateral contacts, other family members. Okay, let me stop you there because you've just listed several things, and a lot of the things that you've mentioned corroborate or validate several of the uh, uh, techniques that we've heard mentioned either by Larry, Mark, or uh, from our folks at the other uh, field classroom. So that's extremely helpful. Uh, sound sound accurate to you? Very much so. Yes. Okay. You guys clearly have done your homework. Let's go quickly now. To let's go quickly now to Oklahoma Western and, and get get your input on this. Uh, this is Ben, Western District of Oklahoma. The only thing we might add, other than uh, obvious employment restrictions, uh, would be developing good relationships with uh, family members for informational purposes, and uh, also a system of uh, give and take for uh, reward versus compliance. Excellent point. Uh, thanks. Again, you guys are, are doing your homework and making this a very, very interesting discussion. Um, before we come back to the panel here, I know that we have a fax, so let's go to David Leathery for that. Dave? Ah, we're not ready for it yet, so we're going to come back to the panel, uh, get some reactions from Lanny first. Um, well, three things uh, that came to mind during the sure. discussion. Uh, first one is that these guys display a lot of the same characteristics as, as somebody with an antisocial personality disorder, and all of us have been dealing with that, you know, throughout our careers. Mm -hmm. uh, the second thing uh, that I think is really important is getting the the family involved, or, or significant others, or friends, or whoever in, in the supervision, especially if they are mm -hmm. living with somebody, mm -hmm. because they're going to be a really good source of information to us. Mm -hmm. uh, and the third thing is is that. We really need to, need to not ignore the fact that these traditional supervision techniques are very important. Uh, the computer-related things that we may have to do with them to com ensure compliance or try to ensure compliance are, are important, but the, the basics uh, are really going to be what make things work for us. Interesting. Okay. Larry Hawley, I want to ask you about the employment uh, situation of Kevin Mitnick, but before I do that, my understanding is that we are ready now uh, to go to that fax. So, David Leathery? 
Okay, thank you. Yes, we have a fax here from uh, Northern Ohio, and the, the fax reads to the effect that uh, we have a hacker convicted of a child porn offense. Would you comment on whether hackers are pure computer offenders or whether they may commit other offenses like weapons, drugs, etc.? Lanny? Good question. Uh, I think it's just like any other un person who's in involved in crime. If they get into something and get involved with it and get away with it, they may explore other options. Sure. Uh, and I think it's important to keep in mind that, and we'll see this in our later example when we cover the set of vignettes, that it's quite possible f for somebody to commit several different types of offenses or at least be accused of committing yes. several different types of offenses and you got to keep that in mind you're going to have to juggle you know perhaps two or three balls at the yeah. same time yeah. keep your eye on the ball exactly. uh, good question thank you uh, I want to go now back to Larry Hawley because Larry our folks in Oklahoma Western mentioned the employment situation and I know that Kevin Mitnick has some pretty severe uh, employment restrictions, and I'm just wondering how you've handled that. Well, I think one of the, one of the things the courts let us be is a little creative in, in developing, uh, you know, manners to, to supervise these individuals, and I think one of them is in employment. What I've done uh, would, uh, is that, and Kevin, every time he's offered a job or anything, uh, I have him provide the prospective employer with a copy of his JNC and then I also mm -hmm. follow up with that employer uh, about uh, their their understanding of what the restrictions and the requirements are as far as Kevin's probation supervision mm -hmm. and then they in turn will submit a letter to me acknowledging that they've received a copy of the JNC they understand it and uh, that uh, his employment will not violate those conditions so I have them buy into it also so that it's kind of uh, a mutual admiration society here with all three of us involved. And how about Kevin Mitnick? Has he bought into this? He bought into it wholeheartedly. He said, that's great. He said, uh, that's fine. I, I agree with that. He's the one that faxes them, the JNC, and I make sure that, uh, you know, that, that I, I get a copy of the letter and I speak personally to the employers themselves. So basically, uh, I mean, we know that his restriction, his employment restrictions, or his restrictions on the use of computers and connected devices, are pretty severe. Is he gainfully employed now? He's he's got a he's in fact he's speaking before um, a, a Giga Group. It's a, a corporate security. Uh, he's going to be the keynote speaker to that this coming twenty uh, seventh of this month and. Um, and uh, you know he's he's got another uh, situation where he's working with Contentville and he's writing a monthly article. He's done one article so far, and and uh, so he provides us copies of what he's submitting and stuff like this, so we can review it. And as as I told him, you know we'll do these, and then we'll see we'll get the feedback from everybody else because uh, you know I found collateral contacts to be extremely helpful. I mean I have FBI agents, I have uh, the the POs from other districts the and this district and everybody letting me know. So, um, you know, I get a lot of feedback, even from the newspaper uh, reporters and TV reporters and stuff like this. So every time he does something because of his high profile, I get, I get feedback, and it helps. Excellent. And Ed Harrison has been extremely helpful. Thanks, Larry. This has been a fascinating discussion. Uh, we've covered quite a bit, um, but unfortunately we've run out of time. Uh, so thank you so much, Mark and Larry, for joining us over the phone. Thank you. And Lanny, thanks, and stick around for the next panel. Uh, to reinforce what we've just discussed, we'll leave you now and at the end of each segment with some learning principles. Then Dave Leathery will return uh, to take us into our next segment. just learned what hackers do. Now to become more familiar with the tools that I might use, our advisory committee of officers thought you should take a virtual tour of some computer gadgets and hardware. 
So earlier this summer, we turned the studio here into a computer store. Leading us through this maze is Scott Chin, a supervising probation officer here in the District of Columbia, who also happens to be his district's automation coordinator. Scott, thanks for being here. Glad to be here, Mark. Um, before we get uh, to all of the equipment and hardware, mm -hmm. let me first ask you a more general question, which is, why is it important for officers to know about this stuff, and how does it relate to their job? Okay. Mark, it's about uh, accessing information, illegal information, uh, receiving that information, and then modifying that information in a criminal format. Officers now, uh, given the cyber environment we're at, need to understand what the, what the landscape looks like okay. and what are some of the tools that uh, cyber criminals are using to commit the crimes. Okay, and we've got several of those tools here. Yes, we we've split them up into groups, so okay. let's start at the beginning sure. with group one, the basic workstation. Okay. Mark, this is your standard uh, computer, your CPU, central processing unit. Uh, officers need to look for uh, clone versions and illegal loaded software. Okay. Your monitor, uh, this is a standard monitor, but look for the high-end flat screen monitors, color high resolution monitor. color monitors, yeah. high-end resolution monitors used for counterfeiting and for child pornographers. Okay, and this contraption? This is your standard inkjet printer. Mm -hmm. You can print out basic spreadsheets, drug transaction forms, uh, whatever uh, text documents you may use. Uh, the officer needs to look for laser jet printers that can print out crisp, clean documents, uh, counterfeiting uh, type documents, and also child pornography images. Okay. Now, still sticking with group number one, the basic workstation, what do we have here? Okay. Mark, this is your basic laptop, notebook, computer. This is the same thing here, except in a smaller, more mobile environment okay. here. So we're getting portable with this. That's right. Uh, you can do the same thing, like I said, there, except this is concealable. So if an officer comes to the house and he's looking around for a computer, right. this can be put in the trunk, this can be stored under the bed, anywhere. All right, so we're getting smaller, more portable, and more difficult to detect. That's correct. Okay, now we're going to move on to group two. What do we have here? Okay, Mark, what we do have is, the key here is the storage capacity of, of these devices okay. and their external, uh, their external components. Number one, basically, offenders can hide this stuff in the house when an offender comes to, the, to do a home visit. Okay. These are large, these are jazz, zip drives, they can be large amounts of information and files can be stored on these okay. and, and can be stored and hidden away from the officer. Okay, as opposed to the more traditional hard drive, which is what we have here. That's correct, right? Mark. And that would be installed in a regular CPU. That's correct. Uh, or even a, a larger, more old-fashioned external hard drive. Uh, they, they store a lot, these new different types of drives and disks, mm -hmm. zip and jazz, and CD, which we'll talk about in a minute, right. store a lot of information, lots more information, and they're portable. That's correct. So they can be hidden from officers. That's correct, Mark. Okay. Uh, another item here is your CD uh, recordable. Basically, you can take the CD out, put it in a CD recordable machine, okay. put it in, download the information, and you're ready to go. So this is another storage type of device on a CD level. All right. Okay. Well, that's pretty comprehensive in terms of storage devices. Right. Now, moving right along to our next group, okay. let's take a look at some graphics devices. Okay, Mark, this is your handheld scanner. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, you just scan a document, whether it be a fraudulent driver's license, passport, or whatever. So you just pass that right over the document. That's true, and it goes right into the computer. Okay. Uh, here's a desktop sc uh, scanner. Right. Uh, or what you can do is for child pornography images, uh, counterfeit documents, right. uh, whatever uh, imaging item you need to photograph and modify in the computer can be done here. So there's a trend here. We're becoming more and more sophisticated, more and more portable, as mm -hmm. we saw with the, with the scanner and with some of the storage devices. And speaking of portable, right. sticking with graphics stuff, we've got a camera. Okay, Mark, this is your basic digital camera. There's no film in it. It's held digitally in, in the camera. What happens is you take so many pictures and you download it to the, the PC mm -hmm. and then you can view your images there. So no film required for this? No film required. Officers need to know that if they go to uh, their offenders' <coughs> homes and they say digital recorders or digital uh, video cameras, mm -hmm. they need to watch out. That should ra raise a red flag, uh, especially if the offender is a child pornographer. Very interesting. Okay, let's move along uh, to our next group, which deals with communications devices. Okay. Scott, what do we have here? What is this monstrosity? Mark, this is your basic fax machine. It serves a dual purpose. Number one, you can receive information, and then you can print information from your, your laptop or your CPU. You can receive threatening devices, photos of children, uh, counterfeit documents can come through here. Mm -hmm. This is your standard, standalone fax machine copier. 
Okay. Your computers, like the laptop, will also have that same feature of okay. receiving faxes and sending faxes. All right, and this is something that straddles the line between graphics and communication because it has the, both capabilities. It can copy and print, and it can communicate. That's right, Mark. Okay. Uh, sticking with uh, communications devices, but getting more sophisticated, more okay. portable, what are these gizmos? Mark, these are called, and for the special conditions when the court imposes, these are called connected devices. Okay. Uh, but on the technology side, they're called PDAs, Personal right. Digital Assistance. Okay. Here's a larger version. Version You can store information, receive information off the Internet. If there's no wireless connection, you can have an external uh, connection to the computer, okay. or you can use the cell phone to dial in. Okay. Okay. I think more, uh, more in line has been the smaller Palm Pilot. Same thing. You can receive information. Okay. It's used for calendaring, uh, email even uh, logging into the internet. Okay, so welcome to the 21st century here. Exactly, I mean, Mark. I, mean, I think one of the sort of common denominators here is not, not only the wireless capability, but the screen. Correct. In addition, Mark, if there's no wireless capability, you can use a cell phone to dial in. Right. Regarding the cell phone, now you can receive information, email, dial into the uh, internet and receive information in a larger screen. Okay. Okay. All right. And what are some of these other gadgets okay. back here? Mark, this is an external modem that's used. A uh, wire goes into the computer or your mm -hmm. laptop, and then you, pl you plug in your phone line here, and you're ready to go. Okay, and now most computers, or pretty much all computers, are coming with internal modems. That's correct, Mark. Just little cards that are in the actual machines. Right. It can either be in a laptop or in a, in a regular desktop. Correct, computer. and all you do is just plug your phone line in, and you're ready to go. All right. And these cords? Yeah. Mark, these are called, uh, these are basically fat, fat pipe lines. Okay. Uh, if you take a look at it, uh, the connection is a lot bigger than your telephone line. Uh -huh. This will allow you to receive more information faster. Okay. Okay? Uh, this DSL cable lines, they receive a lot of information. And DSL standing for? Digital subscriber line. Got it. So uh, your child pornographer would want information quickly okay. and a lot of information. All right. Okay. Um, now finally, we're going to move on to some equipment here in our last group. Okay. of hardware, uh, much of which uh, has no legitimate purpose. Exactly. Maybe you can elaborate. Mark, these are called skimming devices. Uh, an offender will run a credit card through it, okay. download it into the PDAs, and then transfer that information into a reader, writer, or encoder. Okay. okay? What happens is stolen credit card uh, is received here, okay. placed in here. All right. So in this, in this takes all of the full track data. Right, okay. off the uh, encoder. Right. And what happens is this information is placed in the reader writer, right. and you take a blank credit card and run it through, or your credit card, which could be a Visa, right. the card he scanned could be a MasterCard, right. and you would take his information okay. and be able to use his credit. And the, and the victim wouldn't know until he gets his monthly statement 30 days later. So again, we are getting portable and more sophisticated, and there's more stuff for the officer to look out for. That's correct, Mark. Uh, we were recently uh, at the Secret Service here in Washington, mm -hmm. um, and they are the ones who deal with credit card fraud, and they thought it would be a good idea for us to show officers uh, two other pieces of equipment, okay. the embosser and the tipper. The embosser being the machine that raises the numbers and letters, on the credit card, mm -hmm. and here's the credit card stock with the magnetic strip, and the tipper, which puts the gold, silver, or black uh, coloring on the card right. and on the raised letters and numbers, um, and that's sort of part of the credit card fraud package. Very cool. Had to, couldn't turn it down, so here it is. Okay. Okay. Uh, so this is the stuff I guess officers need to be looking out for, eh? I think so, Mark. They should have this, this type of hardware should not be in the home at all. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Mark. You'll get a chance to meet Scott when we return from our five-minute break. In the meantime, please keep your faxes and questions coming. And please take time to complete your rosters and evaluations. We'll be right back. <laughs> 